Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the pre-concert talk. Um, my name is Dylan Maddox. I'm the artistic director of the Oklahoma Baroque Orchestra. And I have my lovely friend and colleague, Dr. David Howard here. He's the director of the Schola Cantorum, Oklahoma. And we have our wonderful um, concert master that we have um, contracted for the season, Dr. Francis Liu. Um, and, and we wanted this to just be kind of casual. I mean, we, 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 we'll, we'll take any questions, you know, whether that's about the, the program, what kind of the vision was, what we're achieving, or what some of the instruments you might, might see are, or, you know, some differences in the Baroque violin, some thoughts on, on playing, what do the instruments, um, what, what does that add, you know, these sorts of things. But we really wanted to not just give like a lecture and, and just talk at you guys, but we wanted you guys to be involved. And so we, we really wanted to open this up first as a Q&A, and, and, and then if, if, if everyone's shy and there's not too many questions, then maybe I'll, I'll facilitate more of a discussion. But uh, just to open it up, are, are, does anyone have any questions about early music, historical performance, um, Oklahoma Baroque Orchestra? Yes. Yeah, so we're really lucky um, to have three fantastic board members um, at Oklahoma Baroque Orchestra. One of them is Dr. Nathan Doherty. He was actually supposed to be um, helping us lead this discussion and sing in the choir. Um, he's a musicologist at OU. He's had a, a family emergency come up and so he's not here tonight, but um, it's wonderful because he directs the early music ensemble down there and we have a close relationship with him and, and, and uh, David is also a, um, the assistant director of choral activities at OU. And so we have a close working relationship with OU, but then additionally we have um, Joey Ripka, who is the organist and music director here at St. Paul's. And he directs the early music ensemble at OCU. Um, and, and so some of the instruments here are borrowed from OU. Some of them are borrowed from OCU. And then um, Mike Guybe, our, our violone player, he also serves on the board and is the um, general coordinator for the Brish Center um, at, at UCO. And so some of the instruments are from UCO. So, so the, the wonderful thing about Oklahoma Baroque Orchestra is we've been able to take all three of these major academic institutions and, and, and really kind of link up and pool our resources together. So it, it was great that, that the OU Trombone Studio and Collegium Musicum allowed us to, to borrow some of their instruments and as well as the other universities. So, so yeah, the sack butts uh, will, will be very cool. Uh, the, they have a very unique timbre. Um, I think mimics the human voice really beautifully. And um, I was talking with one of them last night um, and, and I don't know much about sack butt. I'm not a sack butt expert by any means. Um, and, and you'll see an alto sack butt, which looks like a you know, kind of a mini trombone. And I was told that this sack butt that I, I think is you know, pretty big compared to a trumpet, but small compared to a trombone, it has the same length total as a, as a trumpet, which, which I thought was so odd, but the trumpet is just all you know, wound up together and that sack butt is the, the same length. So, so it looks bigger and the, we'll have alto, tenor, and bass, and then recorder playing the, the treble part, so. I, just a, a word on that. There's a long association with um, trombones and voices in sacred music, uh, or sack butts, we should say. So um, you're gonna hear in the uh, choral works, uh, we're gonna be, the, the instruments are gonna be playing with us, including the sack, sack butts, doubling some of the, some of the vocal parts. And there's a, a long tradition of that. Uh, in fact, trombones have, have often been associated with uh, sacred or solemn works. So for example, even in, um, even in opera, for example, when Mozart writes Don Giovanni, and he's, he wants to uh, sort of highlight, uh, I think it's the scene where Giovanni's dragged to 
to hell in this very solemn scene by the commendatory. Yeah, the commendatory, there are trombones, yeah, that are, that are used in that, because of that close uh, connection with trombones or sackbuts and sacred music. It's really interesting. And, and we can, you can cite so many other examples of uh, trombones really um, highlighting that uh, sort of otherworldly or, or sacred aspect, so. I mean, a lot of the, because this is a early Italian um, early German Italian kind of program, you know, a lot of the um, functions of the instruments have yet to be sort of totally parsed out. And a lot of it has to do with um, how they're employed. And usually, you know, we sort of, we talk a lot about consorts of instruments, you know, because so those are the ancestors of, you know, what we call like the string family and the wind family. But actually back then, you know, we would have had like, for example, wind bands, um, which would have had a military use, you know, because they play, you wouldn't have had string players playing outside, certainly. Um, and uh, like the, the sackbut is a perfect example of like it's one instrument, but you have all these different sizes of the one instrument. Um, and then there was also a distinction between the viola da gamba family, right, and the the violin string family, right. So the viola da gamba family it was a softer instrument. It was considered something that was um, acceptable to be used by nobility, whereas the violin was considered you know, a tavern instrument. You would have never, you know, didn't at all have the same connotation. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you'll hear a little bit of that as well, this idea of like, you know, well, here's one consort and now here's another one, you know. And, and, and you'll find that in a lot of, uh, like, like Francis was saying, a lot of the instruments that are now, you know, find a home in our modern concert hall had very rustic barnyard type origins. And one, one instrument I immediately think of is the bassoon. We won't have any period bassoon tonight, um, maybe, maybe in the future. But, but th these sorts of instruments are, were, were, were used for communal music making, not in the highest courts, some in the highest courts, and some, some just you know, in the home or at a, at a get together or at the bar. And, and so, it, it, it's funny how over the hundreds and hundreds of years we've appropriated them to, and, and now have put them all on pedestals in our, in our concert hall. So, it, and, and another thing on what Francis was saying is, is he was saying that these instruments are somewhat indeterminate. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll note this in the, in the notes, program notes. Um, a lot of this music is not scored for a particular instrument. It just, uh, the score might say treble one, treble two, alto one, alto two, tenor one, you know, so on and so forth. And, and so really you, you kind of see what instruments you have at your disposal. Um, and then you just throw those on that part and, and, and it sort of works out. Yeah. I mean, so later when um, a lot of this music uh, gets imported to, into England, for example, um, England is kind of a, a weird, outlier <laughs> of, of Baroque music, because there are a lot of traditions that exist earlier on the continent and then end up there and then kind of evolve in their own sort of bizarre way. But what you get a lot of is broken consort, which is, just means that instead of having, you know, a consort of, of winds um, or a consort of gambas, you know, you have actual mixture of like, you know, you'll have a, a recorder, a, a violin, and then a, a, a gamba and a harpsichord, for example, like, you know, what we're used to in, in just thinking about normal chamber music, um, but they call that the broken consort you know, because it's a mixture. Uh, I would add one other thing, which is that you know we have these weird vestigial things that continue even today. So you know the, a double bass. Sometimes if you look into a modern symphony orchestra, you'll see um, different kinds of double basses, right? Some of them are shaped more like cellos, where the the top bouts are curved, and sometimes you'll see you know this sort of V shape. And it's because that uh, double bass um, takes, well, some double basses take their shape from violones, from the gamba family. Um, I, and I that's, that's one right oh, here. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. so what you'll see tonight is, is, is this hybridization of um, two families of instruments. Uh, I mean, the modern bass is a hybridization yeah, of yeah, yeah. the gamba family and the violin family. <laughs> And the, the kind of vestigialness of that that Francis was talking about is these sorts of instruments, including modern bass, is tuned in fourths rather than fifths, like violins and violin violins and cellos. Right. Um, and, and 
another thing on that is that double basses have a flat back often. They oftentimes have a flat back to them rather than a rounded back like on a fiddle. And that's also a holdover from, um, from the gamba family. Does this have, yeah, this, this one has a flat back. This will probably be the only time you can see it since, I guess it's, since he'll be holding it. But it has a flat back and a rounded. I mean, you can you can come top. up and take a look. Yeah, come you come up and it, take a uh, look. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that yeah. kind of was us rambling onto a few different topics. I think that that, that was nice. Are there any questions, follow ups, or nothing? Well then, maybe Francis, can, could you talk with, with them a little bit about the differences between what you have in your case and what you might find at the Philharmonic? Um, sure. Well, what they're playing on the Philharmonic is probably more expensive, for one thing. <laughs> um, so, uh, I would say the biggest differences, I mean, it's, it's sort of funny because, you know, at the fundamental level, any string instrument is really just a wooden box, right? With with you know with with st string, right? <laughs> um, but there are a few differences, um, you know, namely the shape of the neck and sometimes the, the angle of the neck. Um, but you know, I would say that there isn't as much difference between a modern violin and a baroque violin as you would think. Um, the biggest difference is obviously the gut strings, which come from the intestines of a sheep. Um, sometimes they're called cat vines, and they, that, it's not because they're from cats. Um, it might be a, a sort of strange transliteration of, of um, like caterpillars, like silk. That's like one theory, and we're not totally sure. Um, but it's usually sheep, sometimes um, beef, um, and that is the biggest difference in terms of sound production because um, it's a, like what Dylan was saying, it's a more rustic sound. It's a more, I would say, earthy and possibly more human sound as opposed to what uh, most modern players play on now, which is synthetic core, which is probably like nylon that's overwhelmed with metal. Um, sometimes silver, sometimes chrome, sometimes aluminum, that sort of thing. That's the biggest difference in terms of the violin. Another thing that you'll see Baroque players doing often uh, it has to do with how they hold the instrument and how they choose to play it. Um, you know, just like fiddle players, you know, sometimes you'll see them playing down here, right? Um, and sometimes up here. Uh, and it's true that back in the day, uh, we have documentation that, you know, um, a lot of this early Italian era might have been played, you know, right around here. Um, and there isn't, people generally don't have chin rests because chin rests weren't invented yet. So what we try to do is, and it does make it harder in some ways, what we try to do is approximate to the best of our ability without getting injured, of course, <laughs> Uh, how they played in hopes that informs how we interpret the music. So that will change, for example, the kinds of fingerings I'll use, um, how I might activate the resonance of the instrument and things like that. Um, this violin is, uh, I'll just say this now because people are always curious about instruments. Um, this violin was sold to me as a Scottish instrument but it was probably made by a German maker. Um, the interesting, so it, it is pretty original. It's from around maybe 1790. Um, the neck, and basically on all violins, you have a, a block that goes right here and a block at the bottom and then four corner blocks. And that's what holds the whole violin together. That's the foundation of like the pillars of your house, right? Um, so the top plate and the bottom plate and the ribs are all glued around those blocks. Um, guitars have blocks too, for example. What's interesting about this violin, you won't be able to see it, but the neck and the neck block are actually one piece. It's one piece of wood, which means that this neck was never removed because it wasn't possible to do that. 
Um, and the ribs of the instrument actually snap in, and it's a faster way of making an instrument. It's uh, kind of the way that they make a guitar, for example. Um, and what that means is that um, this is not a super, super primo instrument. It was made very quickly. It's probably made by one person, which is different from nowadays, where sometimes um, they're made by like whole towns of people. One person will only make the neck. One person will only make you know the top plate. Um, but it was definitely played a lot because um, there's like a layer of varnish <laughs> that is just totally caked on and I would need to take, I would need to like employ a luthier with like some serious chemicals to remove it um, if I really wanted to do that, but I think it ages well. So, so you can see that the top is dark, but actually it probably was more of this color originally, a little lighter, you know, so. Um, the, the other thing you might notice uh, when we're playing today is that our bows are shorter and they're actually shaped a little differently. And for sure, this is a huge difference from a modern bow. Um, you won't see Baroque bows at a normal symphony concert. Um, it definitely informs, it's sort of, how would I describe it? I, um, I often employ the analogy of, it's sort of like the difference between driving a sports car and driving an SUV. So a modern bow is heavier, um, it's more stable, uh, it's sometimes less nimble as well. Uh, and that's really well suited for playing the really long sustained lines of say like a Brahms symphony or um, you know just like long connected melodic lines. Um, these two bows, one's shorter than the other but they are both Baroque bows. A modern bow would be even longer. Um, they're both quite a bit lighter, they're way more nimble and they let me play fast notes quite a bit faster and also allow me to um, use different kinds of articulation. So for example, when the singers tonight are proclaiming words, I'm also trying to think about, well, this word starts with a, a T or this word starts with a, a V or a W. So that will change the way I, I play the notes. Um, you can do that with, I mean, it's all about finding the right tool for the right situation. You know, you, everything you do with the Baroque bow, you can do with the modern bow, it's just a lot harder. And conversely, like I wouldn't want to play the Brahms concerto on like one of these bows. Um, this is a clip-in bow. It's modeled after a bow at the Powerhouse Museum in Australia. And it's from around 1700, not the bow, but the, the bow that it's modeled on. And it's called a clip-in bow because it is the frog clips in. So if I were to remove it, there's a little, sort of mortise here, and if I pull, I can just remove the frog. And then what you have is, you know, hair that's just on the stick. It's tensioned by putting the frog in. Um, and all bows probably were like this uh, because screws were really hard to manufacture and you would have had to have drilled into the stick and it was just a more advanced level of technology than what they cared about doing <laughs> in uh, the 1680s or 1700s. Um, this bow is something you would have found way later in the Baroque, maybe even into the classical period. And it's longer and it has a screw um, to tension the hair um, and it just handles a little bit differently. So, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. So when did we transition from get to... Oh, that's a Yeah, so question. actually they were using gut all the way through the 1940s. Um, you have uh, some players that for sh might have switched over the steel E's because the E's tend to break. They're the thinnest string. They're the closest to breaking tension. Um, they're about at, oh, I don't know, maybe like um, something like 85 or 90 percent of capacity. So E's break and that's part of the excitement. I mean, I don't really mind. <laughs> like, yeah. I, generally speaking in a concert if the E breaks because audiences kind of love to see that it's part of what makes live performance better than a recording um but there, yeah there were even some german orchestras i think that required a gut e right to, that's to, true to yeah play. so as as the transition so part of the reason why people switched over to synthetic strings or steel e specifically in the 1940s was because there was a gut shortage uh during world war ii and um, so, you know, these recording, and so orchestras would also 
um, in order to create a more unified sound, they, they agree for the entire section what kind of strings to use. Um, not always, but mostly for the professional groups. Um, like the, I think the Concertgebouw Orchestra was one of the last orchestras to switch over. And maybe one of the first ones, I think I hear, I've heard that there, there might be switching back to gut as well. Um, but uh, um, I guess, so yeah, so like record, like the, the, the recordings of Fritz Kreisler, those are all on gut. Um, Yasha Heifetz played on gut. Um, he used a steel E, an unwound A, so a raw gut A, and then uh, his bottom two strings were gut with metal wound over them. Um, I'm trying to think of any other violins. So it's Oystrog. Ah, uh, oh, oh yeah, the Russian school is really really interesting because they were really they're actually known for using not only a steel E but a steel A. Oh, uh, that might have been a resource issue, mm -hmm. um, but it was something. It was they, the Russian violin school was known for this kind of uh, in, like strong kind of fuzzy sound, uh, maybe not fuzzy, but, and also when you think about it, the transition from the color, the, the sound color of, the, of a metal string to a gut string is, can be really drastic. So actually using two metal strings yeah. um, maybe would help. It's just a different kind of philosophy. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, gut strings are not only an old thing. They are a 20th century thing yeah. too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think what's really interesting uh, is that, um, I mean, obviously the manufacturing process has changed, right? They used, you know, um, a lot of the strings that I use are produced by hand by a specific person, right? As opposed to a factory, you know, using gut and processing it at a much faster rate. Um, and then there are only a handful of makers that produce them, so there's, um, Dan Larson, uh, I think he's out in Michigan. You know, there's uh, Damien, who's in Italy. Uh, Mimo Perufo, who's also in Italy. I mean, it's like you can count. And when they pass away, you're like, oh no, I gotta find another manufacturer. It's the same with Harp's Crew. Yeah, right, yeah. right exactly. Um, and a lot of those manufacturing processes were lost as gut went out of fashion uh, in the 1940s through uh, and, and afterwards. Um, and I guess, oh, I, I do have one kind of fun anecdote is that in the Baroque period, violin E's, because they broke so often, um, they were, the, Naples was known for producing amazing E strings. The, the thinnest string, they lasted the long, you know, it sounded the best. And the French government actually put out a bounty um, for industrial espionage wanting to get their hands on the manufacturing process of, of these strings, of these Neapolitan you know, strings. Um, I don't really know if anyone, you know, you would have had to find someone in Italy willing to you know, betray their country, essentially, in order to make that happen. <laughs> you know. The guilds were very powerful. The guilds were very, very powerful, that's right, yeah. Well, any, any other questions? Yes. We've done a lot of talking. You want to chat about some choral <laughs> stuff? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, well, the characteristics of the music from this time period. Yeah. Um, well, they 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 could certainly talk uh, about this too. But um, from a from a vocal standpoint. So we're, we're looking at uh, music that, um, you're gonna hear uh, pieces from duets and trios, uh, two duets and a trio from, from uh, Heinrich Schutz, who uh, spent time in, in Venice, uh, who it, it really took that Italian style of music back to Germany. Um, he was a very practical church musician, so the, the, the pieces that you'll hear are from a collection called uh, Keine Geistliche Konzert, there are two of those. Uh, little spiritual pieces, little little uh, pieces of uh, sacred pieces. Very practical church musician. I got four basses today. I'm going to write a piece for those four. I have two sopranos and a tenor or whatever. So a lovely, lovely uh, collection of those pieces. But then on the other hand, you'll have large scale work. So um, particularly in Venice, you have the, the 
sort of the inauguration of, of Cori Spazzati, uh, separated choirs of antiphonal choir, multiple choirs. I often think about it, it must have been interesting for a worshiper in Rome, maybe having been familiar with the music of Palestrina, maybe a six voice, six part motet, a very, very sort of homo, predominantly homo rhythmic, homophonic, very attention to vertical sonorities, beautiful music. Uh, but then traveling to Venice, to San Marco, and hearing a piece by Gabrielli, where you have multiple ensembles, maybe three choirs of, of voices and instruments separated, singing a very luxurious, uh, sort of exuberant uh, sound, such that you'll hear tonight, it must have been quite, uh, I've sort of used my imagination to, to feel what it must have been like to enter that space and hear that. It would have been a sensory overload, you know, of just fantastic stuff. So, uh, so you have this, this, this inauguration of, of uh, multiple choirs, the, the incorporation of instruments together, and we sort of see this, this, this progression towards uh, obviously the, the classical era and the romantic music and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you have um, a, an in, increase in vocal virtuosity um, 1600 is a very important year, so uh, we especially we will hear in the very final piece by Monteverdi. We can see in Monteverdi's work uh, through his, through his uh, especially his madrigals and the progression of his works through his madrigals, you'll see the uh, attention to vocal virtuosity. So a transition, what eventually winds up being a, 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 a transition, a focal, a, sort of a focus of, of vocal polyphony, vertical sonorities, um, uh, choral situations to uh, solo virtuosic literature, right? Uh, florid singing, etc. cetera. Uh, and you'll hear a little bit of that in, in the final piece, even though it's in seven parts, it's very virtuosic, lots of, of melismatic passages. In other words, many, many notes sung on one syllable of text, etc. cetera. Um, those, those are some of the choral vocal things um, that, 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 that you'll hear. And when we prepare that music, we're, we are cognizant of the fact that we want to allow, adjust our vocal production to serve that music, which is to say um, <clears throat> uh, a, a clear sound, uh, a, 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 a striving for a transparent sound, not a very heavy, sort of um, robust, heavy vibrato sort of sound. We want to hear those individual um, passages, the imitative polyphony, where one part's imitating another. We want to hear those sorts of things. And really um, find a great, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A great uh, melding with what you will hear in the instrumental ensemble. Well, I, hope, I hope that answered some of the questions, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that we're just about out of time for the pre-concert talk. Um, we'll have to let the rest of the concert goers in that, that didn't want to attend the lecture. Poor, poor decision yeah. on that part, <laughs> certainly. Um, but but I, we hope you enjoy the concert and, and hope that this gave you a little bit of insight into our um, music making process and some of the thoughts that that we have to consider in this early music, historically informed performance practice that, that we like to employ. So enjoy the concert and thank you all so much for, for attending the, the, the pre-concert talk. Have a great concert experience. Yeah.